and welcome to the Oddity Archive, the show that claims to be anti-nostalgia, all the while peddling nostalgia, because we're just a teeny bit hypocritical that way. So admittedly, outside of maybe the local news and assuming I'm not too busy with other things, Sven Gulli on Saturday nights, I just don't watch much TV anymore. So perhaps unsurprisingly, when I do encounter especially the really big mainstream network stuff anymore, it's always kind of a rude awakening for me. So, case in point, I've been having a lot of these rude awakenings lately, and thanks to an ongoing health concern amongst an elder member of my immediate family, I am around all the time anymore, and that stupid TV is always on, and whenever I'm within earshot of that thing, I can just feel myself hemorrhaging precious IQ points. I mean, I swear, that Liberty Mutual emu or whatever the hell it is just makes me want to destroy every television ever made and wipe out every network that ever existed. But I digress. So, the really depressing one for me has been the USA Network, one of America's oldest and, at one point, most beloved basic cable channels. I mean, this used to be the home of, uh, of course, Night Flight, but also the afternoon game show block, which was my personal favorite growing up, the USA Cartoon Express, Commander USA's Groovy Movie, Up All Night, and later on some proper self-contained shows like La Femme Nikita, Silk Stockings, and most famously, Monk. Well, nowadays it just seems to be a bunch of NCIS and or CSI reruns. Uh, I add the and or because I can't actually discern the two. And uh, of course, we will punctuate it for a couple hours once a week with some nice, big, bland, boring, sterile corporate professional wrestling. And this is coming from someone who doesn't even like wrestling. So while the network doesn't actually show any signs of going away anytime soon, I feel like I'm still in a good position to eulogize the once mighty USA Network. USA debuted as the, in spite of the name, National Madison Square Garden Sports Network in 1977. No relation to the current one. I'll give you one guess as to what its purpose was. On April 9th, 1980, the channel was rechristened the USA Network. While they did retain some sports programming, USA's main goal shifted towards becoming American Cable's first real general entertainment channel. Having said that, while the station did run some of the standard stuff like sitcom reruns, USA ran a much more eclectic mix of material early on, including nine hours a day of C-SPAN, which became its own entity in 1982, a block of programming that soon became the seeds of the BET network, launched in 1983, the odd original talk show, the curated content kids show Calliope, and, starting in June of 1981, a little thing called Night Flight. Night Flight. Tonight we feature Harlem Merry-Go-Round, starring Duke Ellington and Sarah Vaughn, Discovery of the Week, Night Flight's exclusive interview with Jimmy Cliff, Mink DeVille in concert, be on, easy. on Harlan Ellison's science fiction classic. This critically acclaimed post-apocalyptic black comedy stars Don Johnson. If ever a show was difficult to describe, it would be Night Flight. Actually, I'm not really sure Night Flight counts as a show in the traditional sense. Like the simultaneously running kids show Calliope, Night Flight was an ever-shifting, but usually thematic, curated block of programming. Think of it like a twice-a-week, four-hour video mixtape. 
Anyway, Night Flight aired Friday and Saturday nights at 11 Eastern Time. And this show was truly all about the content. There were no on-camera host segments, just voiceovers from then-local New York-based disc jockey Pat Prescott over a computer-animated, possibly partially scanimate bumper. While no 1981 episodes have publicly surfaced as of my making this, it appears the basic graphics never changed throughout the show's initial run. Off to animation and music videos featuring Art of Noise, Dire Straits, Sarone, and State of the Art videos. Night Flight had numerous recurring segments, but its one and only constant was music videos, particularly the Night Flight 2 music video block. A Night Flight 2 usually kicked off each night's show. This was a commercial-free 20 to 30 minute block of music videos with some kind of common thread. For example, a Night Flight 2 animation, which would be a block of fully or partially animated music videos. Night Flight's music video segments were also noteworthy in that no video was off limits, just in case he ever wanted to see Fee Waybill's wang flopping around during that one tubes video. The music video block would lead, either tangentially or directly, into one of the following. A feature film, usually a cult, art house, or concert film, or a selection of short films or clips from usually public domain features. Other recurring segments included the video artist, regarding computer art, various seemingly sold almost infomercial style, pre-packaged segments on heavy metal, punk, and new wave music, performance excerpts from stand-up comedians, and various other somewhat counterculture material, often presented in a rather stream-of-conscious manner. Tonight's feature on Night Flight, A Boy and His Dog, was made on a shoestring in 1975, and became a classic on the campus midnight movie circuit. Night Flight ended its run on USA at the end of 1988 to make way for USA Up All Night, which we'll look at later. As for Night Flight, it soon returned in syndicated form. Starting in 1990, a new two-hour version of Night Flight began, but unsurprisingly, it was considerably watered down. Worse yet, the feature films were dropped, and the music video blocks began to give way to what amounted to major label electronic press kits touting the latest release from usually already well-established pop, rock, and R&B acts. While Pat Prescott continued to periodically provide linking voiceovers, the quote-unquote flight animation was, save for some recycled USA bits, dropped in favor of an instantly dated home computer motif. In addition, a new on-screen host added some rather dorky wraparounds and bumpers. Sometime in 1992, the show gave way to simply edited reruns of the old USA shows, and the show was quietly withdrawn in 1996. Perhaps unsurprisingly, with all the 80s nostalgia out there, Night Flight has been resurrected twice more in the last few years. First in 2016, with the launch of the Night Flight Plus streaming service, complete with some original 80s episodes. And yes, as of my making this, it is still operational. I took out a subscription to help research this episode. In 2018, the Independent Film Channel, or IFC, aka another channel I could endlessly lament about, tried their hand at a bite-sized 15-minute edition of Night Flight, featuring the more fragmentary, public-domain-heavy end of Night Flight's personality. Shock of shocks, it didn't last. The USA Network, we're a kid's best friend. On a decidedly friendlier and more conventional note, 
After C-SPAN became its own entity in February of 1982, one of the things USA ultimately filled that nine-hour hole with was the daily USA Cartoon Express, which began in September. According to some period articles I've seen, at first, Cartoon Express took over the weekday afternoon slot formerly occupied by Calliope, which got shifted to mornings and weekends. And it consisted solely of 60s and 70s Hanna-Barbera cartoons, and remained so for much of its run. As an interstitial, USA would often throw in their own one-minute-in-a-minute segment which was basically just field communications snippets all over again. As for the main Cartoon Express block, while the basic formula remained intact for at least 10 years, USA would still throw the odd one-off wrench into the works, especially around the holidays. Mr. Magoo's Christmas Carol, anyone? I can't find anything concrete, but if my own increasingly unreliable memory is anything to go by, by the time my family got cable in 1992, the Cartoon Express aired seven mornings a week with an additional late afternoon block on weekdays. Having said that, in spite of the launch of Cartoon Network that same year, which took much of the Hanna-Barbera library with it, I seem to remember still seeing inordinate amounts of Scooby-Doo Where Are You on USA as late as 1995 or so. July is Kids Club Animal Awareness Month, and today we have a special animal-loving guest. In its later years, USA used its partial corporate ownership from MCA to run cartoons that Universal was making at the time. Stuff like Highlander, the animated series. Meh. The Itsy Bitsy Spider, which I don't remember at all. And Problem Child, the animated series which I had successfully managed to suppress the memory of since 1994. Stupid archive. Anyway, the Cartoon Express made its, if you will, final stop in September of 1996. Now, starting sometime in 95, USA had started up a second cartoon block, namely the USA Action Extreme Team. Because, you know, stupid extreme. 90s. As one would expect, this block consisted of action cartoons. You know, the kind that mostly existed to sell action figures. When the plug was pulled on the Cartoon Express, the time slot was handed over to Extreme Team, which came to an end in September of 1998, signaling the end of cartoons on USA. Hi, I'm Marty Hall. Remember all the fun we had playing Let's Make a Deal on TV? Now you can play right over your touch-tone phone. Which door do you choose? You won $200. We won! We won! Great! It's fun, it's exciting, you can win with every call. And you don't even have to dress up like a chicken. $1.95 per minute. Average call, four minutes. Discover a world of entertainment every weekday on the USA Cable Network. The alive and well spirit from Mike Jarrett. As the last of the shared and time purchased content on USA dried up, USA needed something to fill the weekday daytime with. Instead of going with the obvious sitcom reruns or then common imported Canadian and British soap operas, USA latched on to the other daytime favorite the game show. Of course, USA didn't have the budget for its own shows, so they started rerunning some rather unconventional choices. Upon its launch in 1984, the USA Afternoon Game Show Block, as far as I know it never had an official title, seemingly consisted of more panel-driven games such as The Gong Show and Make Me Laugh, 
joined by the Liars Club in 1986. Read the only USA game show block footage I've got. Tonight are four of our charter members. Larry Hobus. Miss Betty White. Peter Marshall. Hi there. And Pat McCormick. Welcome back to Love Me, Love Me Not. It's Carol's turn. Carol, you can steal now since we're in the second round. While the network did add some new Canadian game shows from 1985 to 87, the only truly original games to appear on USA during this period occurred during the commercial breaks. Initially, you had the Game Show Bonanza, which asked a general knowledge trivia question with three potential answers. Viewers would call in to the provided 1-800 number, and 100 callers per day were selected to receive unnamed and probably very minor prizes. And presumably at least one of these people was entered into a drawing to win a free vacation or something of the like. The game show Bonanza was followed in the early 90s by the more famous Lucky Day USA, which had a real live host, namely John Davidson, who up until recently had been hosting Hollywood Squares, also seen on the USA game show block. Lucky Day USA was a more cynical extension of the game show Bonanza, you still had to answer some basic trivia question, albeit now with only two answer options, but now had to call a 900 number at $1.50 a minute. If you answered correctly, you were entered into a drawing to win $1,000. At two minutes per call, as long as 333 and a third people called in every day, it was a nice little money-making venture for USA. Even if they didn't get that many calls, the cost for an advertiser to run a single commercial would have easily covered it. Money back guarantee. Don't just dream of losing weight. Lose weight with Dream Away. The water called with the hair. It's 25. It's 100. You got it. It's the $125,000 pyramid. Well, sort of. You heard it here first. Well, I don't think I'll get away without at least mentioning the two pillars of the USA game show block. Press Your Luck and Pyramid, $25 and $100,000 varieties. I guess this is where I do get a little bit nostalgic. I loved both, or technically all three, shows. The former, being the little sh** that I was, for the whammy animations, which would quite creatively rob contestants of their winnings, and the latter for molding my still ongoing perversions of the English language. It was always a red letter day when there was no school and I could watch Press Your Luck, the new $25,000 pyramid, and the $100,000 pyramid back to back to back. I won't get into the details of either game. There's entire YouTube channels devoted to that sort of thing. I wish I'd saved the tapes I periodically recorded of it. For that matter, I still wish I had the episodes of You Can't Do That on Television I recorded off of Nickelodeon back in 93 and 94. But uh, that's another lament. But I'm off track. The USA Game Show block was phased out starting in 1995. By 1996, the block had been reduced to merely Love Connection reruns, inexplicably paired with The People's Court. This mess ended in 1997. Now, I should note, starting in 1999, USA did try its hand at some full-fledged original in-house game shows, and they were a little on the white trashy side. These, mercifully, died out by the end of 2001. Bringing us back around to the more counterculture vibe of Night Flight is the show that ultimately directly replaced Night Flight in the USA schedule, Up All Night, which launched at the beginning of 1989. 
Up All Night was kind of the logical extension of the modernization of classic TV horror movie hosts. So while the movie channel had Joe Bob Briggs hosting cult films, Up All Night had longtime archive favorite Gilbert Gottfried hosting usually heavily edited sexploitation films. Now, before I go any further, I should briefly note that USA had already had a proper on-camera hosted movie show. This was Commander USA's Groovy Movies, which ran on Saturday afternoons and usually featured not-so-scary 50s creature feature type stuff. Yes, did you see that car that she wrecked? Yeah, that had to be what, a 55, 56 Ford? Boy, if you owned one of those cars today, you, well, heck, it'd probably still be tough to get parts for. Hey, you're talking about parts. It's USA's Camp at Night, starring Dick Wilson. Getting back to Up All Night, in its early months, the former Friday night night flight time slot was filled by the short-lived hybrid variety talk show Camp Midnight. That summer, Camp Midnight was dropped, but one of the show's regulars, namely comedian Caroline Schlitt, was asked to host a new Friday edition of Up All Night. While Gilbert Gottfried held down the Saturday night show until its cancellation in 1998, Caroline Schlitt and her entire crew were fired from Up All Night around the end of 1990, for reasons that remain unclear. At the beginning of 1991, a revamped version of the Friday night show launched, featuring actress-comedian Rhonda Shear. This iteration of the show was... Quite enlightening to my 11, 12-year-old self, even if I thought Gottfried was a lot funnier. All right, assistant to Mr. Gottfried. Now that you've got the equipment up here, keep exercising for me. This muscle's getting a little soft. I need work on it. Up All Night ran two movies per night, with the first movie getting rerun immediately after the second movie, albeit minus the host segments. Anyway, like most good hosted movie shows, there was usually some loose plot tying the host segments together. Maybe Gottfried spent the entire show trying in vain to make a snack, or Sheer would encounter a character from one of the movies. Never anything too deep. Anyway, just as with most cable networks in the late 90s, the major corporations, including the ones that owned USA, decided that idiosyncratic original programming was simply a rotting relic of the 80s and pulled the plug in February of 98, taking most of Up All Night's movie catalog out of circulation with it. As for Gilbert Gottfried, well, as one would expect, he is still doing comedy and hosting a surprisingly decent podcast. Rhonda Shear invented the Ah Bra in 2010, and as a result, now owns exactly 13.7% of the world's resources. But hang on, everyone needs more than one Ah Bra. Get on the phone right now, before the time runs out on the clock. Well, that's it for today's archive. Join me next time when I... Don't continue to lament about how much better basic cable used to be. Not that I couldn't get off on a good tear about the putrid creature that AMC has devolved into. Or Nickelodeon. Or MTV. Or VH1. Or Much Music. Actually, I don't think it's even called that anymore. Or TNT. Or TBS or ESPN, or USA, a place to spend your days and nights, USA, where you can let your mind take flight, USA, 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 it's a great place to stay, USA, music, lights, and mystery, USA, the kind of sports you want to see, USA, USA, USA.
Oh, well, Rhonda will be right back with more of USA Up all night right after this. Yes.